All right, team. Today we will be talking about legal responsibilities and obligations within facility management and design. And really, this is a broad and complicated area of facilities. So the goal for today is really to help communicate to you the complexity and understand as future facility managers the breadth of different legal issues that go into sport facilities. Hopefully after hearing this lecture or watching this lecture, you will have gained a basic understanding of some of the principles related to tort law or contract law and how those would impact facility managers on a daily basis. And of course, because of diversity of these issues, I'm not expecting you to understand all of the idiosyncrasies, but perhaps to get a basic understanding of what's out there. So the basic laws that are going to be most impactful on facilities are going to relate to criminal law, constitutional law, contract law, different types of federal, state, and municipal laws. Now, before we begin, it's important to understand what is the law. Well, the law is a set or a governing body of rules that have been enacted by society that establishes a minimum level of conduct or a threshold that the uh, people of the nation must abide by and not violate. And when there is a violation of those rules, we as a society authorize the different agencies to penalize individuals who have violated these rules because these rules, the laws, are something that we uh, as a society value and expect people to follow. So there are different types of laws. There's federal laws, there's state laws, and then there's uh, local laws. And federal laws are going to be passed by the federal government. There are statutes. State laws are going to be passed by individual states and might differ from state to state. And then local laws or municipal laws are going to be passed by the local governing bodies. And of course, federal laws are the uh, highest laws of the land. State laws are sort of the middle tier. And then there's the uh, municipal laws. So let's kind of jump into this because there's a lot to cover here. Understand that... Um, what might be legal in one state could be illegal elsewhere. So that's why it's important for us as sport managers or facility managers to understand how different laws are going to, um, are going to play out. So uh, laws that might be uh, developed within a municipality might differ from other municipalities or state laws or federal laws. Uh, federal laws certainly cannot be uh, violated uh, in terms of uh, inconsistencies because they're the supreme law of the land, but um, at the at the minimum, it's under, it's important to also understand that uh, in addition to statutes, which I just talked about, uh, federal, state, and local laws, there's what's called common law, and common law is judge-made law that's passed by the that's created by the courts, and here it's going to uh, really apply mostly in contract law and tort law, but we'll get to that. So what is tort law? Well, I'm glad you asked. Tort law really refers to uh, a broad set of claims where someone commits a wrongful act against another individual, and the law is going to enact a penalty to penalize that individual or entity that violates the law, and then also hopefully provide a remedy to an individual who has been injured by that wrongful conduct. And in, tort law is divided between intentional torts and unintentional torts. So intentional torts are some sort of civil wrong. That's It's not a criminal wrong, but instead of civil wrong, where someone intentionally engages in an act that causes this wrongful conduct. So assault and battery, uh, brawls in the stands during the... Um, during a sporting event, that is most likely going to bring up assault and battery. Or defamation, some sort of statement uh, that is actually uh, untruthful that ends up injuring an individual. That would be defamatory. Unintentional torts are a little bit different. Uh, that's going to be some sort of conduct that injures an individual, but it's done 
in a way that's uh, not done with uh, that willful intent. And the most common intentional tort, and one of the most important unintentional torts for uh, the purposes of this class, is negligence. And negligence is conduct that falls below a duty of care where um, society has imposed that duty of care and that the individual has been injured as a direct consequence of that violation of the duty of care. So with negligence, you're going to have duty, breach, proximate causation, and damages. Duty refers to um, a, a, a relationship has been formed between the parties. So it could be coach and player, or could, could be um, that someone voluntarily um, chooses to uh, assume that duty, such as a, um, a passerby, or a player in a game, a pitcher and a catcher, or a pitcher and a batter, there's a duty of care that's owed. And that duty of care is usually to act as a reasonably prudent person uh, or not engage in, in, not subject that other individual to a force, uh, a, a unreasonable risk of harm. And then there's also the potential to create duty through statutes. Uh, the legislature could pass a law that says all facilities, uh, all gym facilities must um, have AEDs, automatic electronic defibrillators. And in that situation, there's a duty by that facility that resides in that state to have an AED. So the duty is created by various standards and to act as a reasonably prudent facility administrator for the purposes of this course. And the facility must protect people from unreasonable and known risks of harm. Now, here on the lower right, we've got uh, a picture of a mascot uh, carrying a hot dog cannon. And so if a mascot is carrying a hot dog cannon, um, it's probably foreseeable that the it's going to be shooting projectiles, and that projectile could maybe hit someone in the face. And the facility really owes a duty to the person who paid the ticket to protect them from a foreseeable risk of harm, which is them being hit in the face. Now, a breach of the duty of care would occur if the facility um, did not protect them from that foreseeable risk of harm. It's either an act or an omission that uh, leads to that breach of the duty of care. So uh, moving away from the example of the, um, of the hot dog cannon, perhaps you're at a uh, racing event and there is not a, a, a chain link fence of an appropriate height that will protect uh, spectators from debris. That would be a breach of the duty of, of care because it's foreseeable that if a, a wreck does happen, that different debris might fly in the stands and injure someone. Now, proximate causation is going to be a direct and uninterrupted connection between the breach of the duty of care and the damages. So, so long as there's not some sort of intervening act that breaks this chain of causation, um, then proximate cause exists. So if the breach of the duty of care here by the mascot is that um, they shot the hot dog cannon at a high velocity too high, and it was during a, a time when the fan was distracted, let's say by a game or an announcement, um, then that could be a direct proximate causation to that person's injury, which might be in the situation uh, they had an eye injury because the foil uh, enwrapped hot dog hit them in the eye. So the final thing would be injuries based off of damages, uh, and that's financial injury. And that's really what, what we would have here. Now, there might be, uh, even if someone is liable for negligence, or not, I guess not liable per se, but instead uh, that the elements of negligence have been met, then uh, what we're looking at is going to be whether or not there's any defenses. So perhaps the uh, plaintiff assumed the risk by mean, uh, knowing and appreciating uh, the uh, inherent risks of that activity and that they therefore assumed that risk. Um, so in baseball, uh, there's what's called uh, the limited duty rule, uh, which entails that so long as the facility owner has um, 
screened, uh, they've screened in the most vulnerable areas for foul balls and that the patrons are given the opportunity to purchase tickets in these uh, protected areas that an individual will be barred um, from uh, or that li- there would be no liability. They would be de- it would be a defense against liability. Now that's not definitive. Uh, different states might have different um, uh, common law on, on the limited duty rule, but if a facility here, the Royals can prove that the individual assumed the risk and knowingly appreciated the risk of going to a ball game and being hit by a hot dog uh, out of a hot dog cannon, then they might have assumed the risk, although that might be more difficult to prove than, say, a foul ball. In addition, um, immunity could come into play. Immunity is just a defense uh, that it might be used by governmental entities um, that would say that would uh, there'd be a law in the books, a statute that would say that governmental entities are not liable for simple negligence. But perhaps um, the same statute would say gross negligence is not something that immunity is granted to. So that's uh, quickly quick and dirty for negligence. And of course, negligence is a very common and popular area because of the different um, issues related to premise liability and projectiles going to facilities and sometimes the violent nature of participating in sports. Now, kind of part of the negligence analysis for facility managers and anyone really in sport management is understanding risk management and the finer points of insurance. Risk management really focuses on several issues. One is identifying and then trying to eliminate or reduce risks um, of liability at a facility. And then also um, it involves trying to look at what sort of best practices or new strategies that could be used to eliminate or reduce the potential for lawsuits. So really risk management is about lessening the likelihood of liability caused by injury. And insurance is a major element of risk management, and insurance is just a, a contract. It's a, an agreement between several parties where one party, uh, usually the, um, the facility, is paying a premium on a, a monthly basis to the uh, entity, to the insurer, and the insurer is going to um, agree to help pay the cost of legal defense, uh, defending a lawsuit, or perhaps if, you're, if the uh, facilities found liable, uh, paying uh, any sort of award against the facility, but it's a ma- matter of contract. But risk management in this two-part process is really helped by the ECT approach. And the ECT approach is just a strategy that's used to implement risk ma- a risk management system. And ECT just refers to the, ev- uh, the fact that every element in this list uh, ends with letters ECT. So the first aspect is reflect, and that really is asking what is the purpose of this program? Why are you trying to implement this program? Uh, Concerns might be um, the potential um, natural uh, disasters that could uh, injure your patrons or your facility or um, liability from alcohol or uh, a litany of things, but really um, the uh, initial part of the uh, reflection stage is to look at the different concerns uh, from a risk management standpoint that your facility might be subject to. Um, so that is really the first aspect of your uh, ECT process. The second process is deflecting and looking at how can a facility deflect liability on others. And this is really where insurance comes into play because, again, insurance is this contract between two entities usually and the insurance company and the the facility. And the facility is going to pay a specific amount of money for a specific term to, uh, to have specific events or situations covered by this insurance policy. In addition to that, perhaps by a matter of contract, a facility can agree, uh, come to an agreement with someone or an entity that wants to lease the facility premise and say, uh, when a certain uh, event occurs, liability is actually with the one renting the facility as opposed to the facility itself, or there could be indemnity um, clauses or um, 
other uh, clauses that will shift the burden of liability from the facility to the, uh, the facility renter. Of course, there's also uh, things called waivers and releases and assumption of risk agreements, and these all help to move liability from the facility to the third party, the participant perhaps, who signs a waiver saying that they understand the risks of participating in the activity and that they'll not sue a facility. Now, the question is, is this document in and of itself legally sufficient for a facility to avoid liability? Well, perhaps that's something we can talk about later uh, offline in, in class. Next would be detect. So detection is really trying to identify the potential issues uh, or, and then also work with individuals who are knowledgeable in risk management. Um, and this is really going to be um, about spot inspections um, and continuous inspection of the facility so that um, the facility is abiding by its duty of care to identify risks to individuals who come onto the facility who should be protected from foreseeable risks of harm. The next part is going to be inspect and then uh, correct. And that's really, uh, again, identifying your dangerous conditions and correcting any sort of identified hazardous or uh, areas that might have liability. So this is important. And finally, re-inspect. Once the, uh, the inspection and repair or correction stage has occurred, um, just merely Putting in that work uh, is not going to be enough, but instead that facility and its employees need to continuously reinspect its areas to make sure that the hazard or condition has been resolved and taken care of. And then this process starts all up all over again by the reflection stage to see, well, what needs to be done or reevaluated to make sure that your facility is going to be free of liability and uh, defects. Now, Part of the risk management process might be using a layered approach to your facility risk management uh, protocol. And when I say layering, what I'm talking about is guarding against a foreseeable risk of harm in different ways. So um, perhaps with, um, with um, foul balls, a sport facility might, in addition to having uh, uh, signs that warn the spectators uh, of fall balls throughout the concourse, perhaps broadcast uh, warnings throughout in the uh, be between innings, have language uh, about fall balls on your um, on your ticket stub, uh, offering protected seating uh, or pro offering uh, patrons uh, the opportunity to buy seats that are protected by netting as well as unprotected. So again, limit the duty rule having ushers and security personnel continuously uh, warn people verbally and then not having these people take their seats while the game is in play, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really uh, the layered approach. In fire safety, there's also um, some um, uh, um, overlapping uh, that can be done. So, for example, have fire extinguishers uh, throughout the facility as well as a fire suppression system, safety signage, uh, the ability to pull uh, fire alarms. So uh, this is just, again, another example of uh, overlapping. So we move on from insurance and risk management discussion, and then, of course, negligence, on to contracts, which is, really insur which is an insurance contract. An insurance contract is a contract. So a contract is defined as a... Um, an agreement between two or more parties um, that where both sides are giving up something and both sides are gaining something. So it's going to be where there needs to be an agreement, which is contains uh, which is um, which is um, consists of offer and acceptance, and then consideration, which is basically an exchange of value between the parties. It doesn't need to be equal value, but approximate value. Um, and then both sides must have capacity, meaning that someone needs to be uh, of the age of majority, uh, 18 years of age, and not have uh, n not um, be someone who lacks sound mind, uh, the ability to uh, uh, appreciate what they're doing and understand what they're doing. And then also they, the, the contract must be for a legal purpose. 
So um, if all four of these steps are met, offer, acceptance, consideration, and then capacity and legality, you will have an actual contract. And once you actually have a contract, the next question is, well, what are the obligations of the parties? And really what we're looking at here is what is in the contract? What are they legally obligated to do? And if one of the parties uh, fails to perform, then that's what's called breach. So a facility really, uh, if they find themselves where, let's say, there's a sponsorship, sponsorship contract and the, um, the company on the other side of the sponsorship contract uh, doesn't pay the money when they're supposed to, then technically that could be a breach. And the facility could have different options. They could ignore the breach and try to settle the dispute. They could actually terminate the contract depending on the materiality of the contract and what's in the language. Uh, and then they could also sue uh, to try to uh, recover whatever they were aggrieved of or what they um, are allowed under the contract. And there's a, a, a contract in the textbook that I would suggest that you take a look at. So um, it's important for facility managers to understand the nature of the contract and understand what they're signing because that contract is going to really be the go governing the relationship between the two sides. Any sort of inconsistency needs to be proved, and then it might be open to interpretation in it through a court. But to avoid unburdensome, lengthy, and expensive uh, litigation, it, it's very important for facility managers to have clearly defined contracts that cover a wide range of issues. The, uh, the, the chapter then talks about property law. And it makes a distinction between real property and personal property. Real property is any sort of property that's going to be attached to the ground. It's immovable, immovable property. Personal property is going to be anything that can be moved. So even though a car is very large, that's still going to be personal property. The textbook talks about eminent domain. And eminent domain is an issue and can be an issue when it's talking about facility. Eminent domain is really the, the taking the power of government to take private property that to use for the public good so long as uh, fair compensation is uh, given to the uh, party that owned the property that lost it through uh, eminent domain. So that plain fair, fair value is incredibly important. Uh, you might see municipalities uh, condemn different uh, areas uh, of land in order to use that to build a facility, a sports facility, that has been done in the past. And of course, there's that famous example of the uh, city of Baltimore flirting with the idea of condemning the Colts and taking them from by eminent domain to prevent them from moving to another city. But ultimately, we did not get a chance to see how that would fly because the Colts left in the dead of, in the dead of night, moving to another city. Nuisance is also uh, important because nuisance really is a, a tort. It's an unintentional tort where a party's use of land interferes with others' rights. So it could be in the realm of facilities if noise pollution or light pollution interfered uh, with another landowner's right or enjoyment of the property. So in communities that um, don't have a lot of uh, l light uh, at night, um, like in, in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, a facility owner could claim that light, the, the over, the over uh, or the, the spilling of light uh, could create um, a nuisance and that could be potentially liable. It's same with uh, noise, loud speakers. Zoning is also important because, again, that is a municipal, uh, usually a municipal consideration that will limit the types of uh, facilities that could be built within a given area. Uh, and if you remember back to prior chapters, uh, the text talks about trying to petition um, local municipalities to change the zoning designation for land. We then move to constitutional law. And constitutional law can be very important, especially if the facility is owned by a state or is, is governmentally owned. 
because that means that the facility is a state actor. And a state actor means that um, the facility must afford all protections that are owed to individuals pursuant to the Constitution, as well as uh, the uh, amendments, uh, any sort of uh, aspect related to freedom of religion, free exercise of religion, freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. All of these um, are going to come into play when you're talking about facilities that are state-owned or that facilities that become state actor by virtue of the relationship between that private facility and the government. So depending on who owns the facility will determine whether or not a facility is a state actor. And again, courts are going to be reluctant um, to ban these rights, um, especially if they uh, regulate specific conduct. Usually con conduct content neutral regulations are more likely to pass. But things like that limit or discriminate against an individual based off of race, religion, national origin, or gender, uh, these are going to trigger the 14th Amendment protections uh, under the Equal Protection Clause. And we saw that in the Lucky case against the, the Yankees, uh, where Lucky uh, was discriminated against because she was a female reporter who was not given equal access to the Yankees' locker room uh, when men could go in, but she could not. And the facility uh, that the Yankees played in was a was a public facility, so that was an equal protection case. Um, of course, unreasonable searches and seizures is also something that comes up because of our uh, um, our constitutional amendment against unreasonable searches and seizures. In addition, uh, Title IX uh, of the civil uh, civil rights laws can apply, and Title VII can also apply. Again, race, religion, national origin. And um, the textbook spends a good amount of time talking about how facilities must comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's going to be uh, Title III of the ADA, which covers places of public accommodation and commercial facilities um, of all different sh shapes and sizes, including uh, gymnasiums, golf courses, um, pub uh, public assembly facilities uh, like um auditoriums, convention centers, stadiums, arenas. So really, um, the ADA uh, is become a very important centerpiece for facilities as it re regards the law. And that's really because um, a, a, almost a quarter of Americans uh, have some sort of qualified disability. And the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act really um, is about making facilities uh, accessible to uh, those with a qualified disability. And facilities uh, who, that are places of public accommodation must remove all architectural barriers uh, so to access, uh, to, to access that facility if that removable is readily achievable. And if it's not, then that becomes an issue. And, and that's something that would have to be further explored in the ADA process. This process really focuses on analyzing sport facilities uh, relating to um, the public accommodation requirements. And public accommodation uh, loss uh, part of the ADA says that you may not discriminate against someone who has a qualified disability. And the qualified disability uh, process is really going to be pretty broad. Uh, it's someone who has a disability or someone who had a disability or someone who is perceived to have a disability, uh, even if they don't have that disability. A disability, it, it must be something that limits, substantially limits one or more major life activities. And a major life activity is going to be something uh, that's, that in, uh, is pretty substantial. Um, and it's going to be something that's such as um, a functioning, such as caring for oneself, performing uh, manual tasks. It's something where you to determine significance, you're really going to look at um, the number or of life activities that it limits or affects and how long that condition has existed for it among the different elements related to um, a qualified disability. Now, uh, if it is something that limits a major life activity, then the ADA is going to require a reasonable accommodation. And a reasonable accommodation is looking at, um, less of, it's going to look at 
um, how easily this disability can be um, um, afford or can be uh, um, addressed. So by adding, can you just uh, help to address the issue by adding uh, steps or uh, help put a ramp, putting a ramp down or helping to use uh, visual instruction instead of auditory instruction or vice versa? Um, so depending on how, uh, how in depth the modification is, that will drive uh, the reasonability and whether or not it's an undue burden. So um, failure to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act can uh, lead to liability. And with the liability, really that's going to be uh, the, the attorney general of the state can sue the facility owner to uh, seek injunctive relief uh, or an individual can hire their own attorney. Uh, the textbook r recommends um, designating an individual um, as the ADA specialist and trying to read as much as that person can to become that expert and to conduct a comprehensive facility audit so as to understand whether or not your facility is ADA compliant and continuously uh, making and revising that plan so that you can determine whether or not you are ADA compliant. Um, just an example here uh, at Fenway Park you see um, that there are several spaces that are designated uh, for individuals who are disabled um, pursuant to ADA rules and um, that a companion uh, must also be able to sit in that same area. So many municipalities also require a certain number of emergency vehicles at all events and that's going to be again uh, statutory law. Uh, statutes are going to be passed by facility or by uh, states and municipalities to require certain um, amounts of emergency vehicles to be present and if a failure to do that could be uh, negligence. So uh, as you can see just from this brief lecture, facility managers really need to familiarize themselves with a diverse range of uh, types of law to live up to their legal responsibilities and it's important to uh, have a properly uh, vetted and created uh, risk management plan that addresses the risks of a facility and uh, just really retaining competent counsel to help guide a facility to uh, abide by its different duties is critical in today's age of litigious uh, of litigation. We live in a very litigious society. So hopefully this was a good lecture, and I hope to continue the conversation with you uh, offline. Thank you.